In this video, we're going to take a look at some trickier arguments that are going to help us refine and develop an understanding, a deeper understanding, of the concept of validity. So recall from the last video that this is the definition of validity. The deductive argument is valid if and only if, whenever the premises are true, the conclusion must be true as well. Or it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. Now, of course, invalidity just says it is possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false at the same time, uh, or equivalently, it's not valid. So these are essentially the same definition, just the opposite. And they're really important that you understand the test here. The test for validity is always make the premises true. If the premises are true, is it possible for the conclusion to be false? If the answer is yes, if we get this true-false combination, then it's invalid. Uh, if, it, if it cannot get the true-false combination, then the argument's valid. So let's take a look at an argument. Either you're good at math or you're good at philosophy. I'm good at philosophy, thus I'm not good at math. Is this valid or invalid? Take a second and think about it. A lot of people are going to say that this argument is valid. Why? Well, it sort of seems to make sense. If you're good at math or you're good at philosophy and you're good at philosophy, then it seems to imply that you can't be both. You got to be one or the other. And in this case, if you're good at the philosophy side, it means you're sort of like right brained or something. And that rules out the possibility of you being left brained, which is that you're good at math. So this seems valid. But in fact, this isn't true. If you really think about it, there's lots of counterexamples. All you need for a counterexample is to find someone or something that is essentially good at philosophy and good at math at the same time, while still preserving the truth of the two premises. So are there such people? Well, sure. You can really just think of any philosopher. So we've got Descartes and Bertrand Russell on the far right, and in the center we have Anjan Chakravarti and Nancy Cartwright, who are contemporary philosophers of science, and they are very good at philosophy and very good at math. In fact, there's lots of examples. Almost every philosopher is good at both things, including myself. I actually better be good at both things because I'm sort of teaching you a philosophy class, and at the same time, this philosophy class represents the foundation of mathematics. Because of these counterexamples, it's clear that the argument is actually invalid because the premises are true and the conclusion can be false at the same time. Now, a lot of people are going to object here, and they're going to object because of the difference between what we call exclusive or versus inclusive or. So here are some simple Venn diagrams to illustrate the difference. Exclusive or says that you can be A or B, but you can't be both. So uh, if you're at a restaurant and you order fries or salad, it might be exclusive or in that sense. You can have the fries, you can have the salad, but you can't have both. Now, inclusive or actually means that both is possible. So if you're at a restaurant and they use inclusive or, well then, sure, you could have fries, sure, you could have salad, but you could also say, hey, could I have a bit of both? And they'll say yes, and that's a really great option because it's always fantastic to have a little bit of both instead of just one thing, uh, a lot of one thing. Now, this is sort of annoying because how do we know in what context uh, are we using inclusive or exclusive or? So logic has sort of settled this quite nicely, because what we're going to say is that in logic, or is always inclusive. And this will sort of just settle it uh, in a simple way, so we always know that or is inclusive, which means it's always possible to be both. Uh, there's nothing about the word or that precludes the possibility that you could have both or be both, or both sides of the or be true. Now, you might sort of think this is weird, that most of the time when we invoke or, it's exclusive, but that's actually not true. What we're going to learn in this course is that the way that we look at logic from the philosophical perspective is that it's built out of natural language understanding. It's built out of the way we sort of see and think about the world. And logic is meant to reflect this natural sort of understanding, this natural way of looking at the world. And so the claim here is that we naturally look at things in the inclusive sense. And there's nothing about or that is exclusive most of the time. Now, you're probably thinking now there are clear examples of something like this, where or has to be exclusive. There is no middle ground. Things like you're dead or alive, or you're in Toronto or Montreal, something like that. And there it seems that you cannot be both. But it's actually not so clear. Is it really true that you can't be both dead and alive? You know, what if zombies exist and stuff like that? Or what if there's a point where you're sort of both dead and alive? Okay, fine. What about Montreal and Toronto? Well, I don't know, maybe there's a little street in Toronto called Montreal, 
And then you could actually be in both. You could be in the Montreal of Toronto. Now, you might think these are dumb examples, and they're clear-cut examples where you can't be both. It's true. For example, I can't be here and not here at the same time. That's actually impossible. So you're either here or not here, but you can't be both. Uh, that is the case. But if you think about it, that has nothing to do with the word or. That has everything to do with what we think belongs on either side of or. So what makes or exclusive most of the time, uh, actually not most of the time, all of the time, is the nature of the things that we have on the either side of the or. It doesn't have to do with the word or in and of itself. So what I'm going to suggest is even if you come up with a case that is this middle case here, where it seems like our options are mutually exclusive, you cannot be both, and it's clear and concrete, um, this is still compatible with inclusive or. Inclusive or doesn't say you have to be both. Both sides don't have to be true. It just says that we're not ruling it out by the logical notion of the word or. So don't worry about this too much for now, just always remember that or is inclusive. Now you can see why this argument is invalid. It's because the or is inclusive. So just because you're good at philosophy, that doesn't mean anything really about your math skills. It doesn't rule anything out, it doesn't say you are or you aren't, so it's possible that the conclusion is false. Similarly, just because you got salad doesn't mean that you got fries or didn't get fries, so we can't actually conclude anything. You may still want to object, because I'm actually ignoring a particular word that is quite important here. And the word that I'm ignoring is either. By ignoring either, I'm sort of cheating. The either is essentially invoking the fact that we are dealing with exclusive or, and that my counterexamples then cannot actually be true. Well, is that actually the case? Now this is where things get a bit dicey, because this is what we're talking about now is how to interpret uh, English and regular sort of uh, conversant English and, and sort of conventions and so on. And we really don't want this course to be about that. We don't want this course to be about your understanding of colloquial English. We want it to be about logic. So I'm going to say that either is actually totally useless and it doesn't do any function here, serve any function, so we can essentially ignore it. Now, I can sort of try and convince you of that, because if you think of my Toronto-Montreal example, let's forget my silly counter that maybe there's a street Montreal and Toronto. Think back to your in Toronto or Montreal. Most of us would think that's exclusive. I'm going to say that again. Think to the example you're in Toronto or Montreal. Most of us think that's exclusive because Toronto and Montreal are separate cities. But notice the exclusivity doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I may or may not have said the word either. When I said you're in Toronto or Montreal, you probably thought it was exclusive. And the reason why is because you know things about Toronto and Montreal. Adding the word either or removing the word either doesn't make a difference at all. Okay, enough of that. Let's just try and remember that or is inclusive. Here's another sort of funny argument that I'm going to use to de demonstrate some sort of like important point about validity. So today is a day. You are alive, therefore, my name is Alex. This isn't a trick, my name is actually Alex, so the conclusion here is actually true. Now the question is, is this valid or invalid? Take a second and think about it. This argument is invalid. The question is, why? Well, a lot of you will recognize this argument as a non sequitur, and a non sequitur is essentially the argument of the internet. The non sequitur is when the premises actually have absolutely nothing to do with the conclusion. So what's interesting about this argument is that today's a day you are alive, therefore my name is Alex. All these things are true, but the truth of the premises does not bear on the truth of the conclusion. It could be that today is a day and it could be that you are alive, but it could be that my name isn't Alex. Now this is where things sort of get weird because my name is Alex, so what are we talking about? Are we talking about possible worlds, etc.? And this is where uh, the sort of uh, problem with English statements sort of rears its head and why we want to move quickly to sort of abstract form where it's a lot easier to be manipulating truth. Uh, so in this uh, example of a non sequitur, she's saying my hand is a dolphin, your argument is invalid. She, pretend she's saying it to me. In fact, she's right. Her premise is true. Her hand is a dolphin. And her conclusion is also true. My argument was invalid. But, of course, her argument is also invalid because it is too a non sequitur. Her dolphin hand has nothing to do with my bad argument. 
they're sort of just coincidentally true at the same time. So even though everything is true here, that doesn't matter. What we care about is whether or not the truth of the premises bears on the truth of the conclusion. And it doesn't in this case. That's why this argument is invalid. So remember that validity is about form and structure, not about actual truth. It's about sort of possible truth. And what we want to do is force the premises to be true and see if the conclusion is going to be false or can be false. So we're going to use this definition in some tricky arguments coming up. But before we do that, I want to take a look at two important sentence properties that uh, we'll sort of use to uh, facilitate these tricky arguments. So here are properties of sentences, or, or I guess more accurately, properties of statements. Uh, the first is a tautology. A tautology is a sentence that is always true, or it can never be false. Now, it's hard to think of tautologies. Uh, a lot of you might just come up with math examples, like a triangle has three sides. Uh, actually, a better example is a triangle has three angles. Why is that always true? Because triangle means three angles. That's OK. Um, there are trivial ways to generate tautologies, like it is raining or not raining, or more abstractly, it is blah or not blah. But fundamentally, a tautology is something that's always true. And likewise, a contradiction is a sentence that is always false. So it is raining and not raining. That cannot be the case. And that has a general form of it is blah and not blah. So tautologies and contradictions. These are probably words that some of you are familiar with anyway. And we're going to invoke them when we look at these tricky arguments. First argument, I like cheese, therefore I'm either tired or not tired. Now remember, don't worry about the either. It's or in this sense is inclusive. Uh, that's how we always look at it. Uh, but let's take a look. Take a second. Think about it. Is this argument valid or invalid? So the answer here is that the argument is valid. Why? Didn't we just sort of see an example of an argument like this? Surely this is a bad argument because this argument is in fact a non sequitur. It's just like the argument we looked at. It might be true that I like cheese, and that has nothing to do with the conclusion. But that's not really what we care about. Just because it's a non sequitur doesn't really matter. What we want to do is we want to apply the test of validity. We want to look at making the premises true and seeing if the conclusion is false. So let's force the premise to be true. I like cheese. Fine. Now, is it possible for the conclusion to be false? Well, take a look at the conclusion. The conclusion is, I am tired or not tired. Well, that's actually a tautology. That is a sentence or a statement in the form of tautology. And a tautology means it is always true. So it's possible for the premises to be true. That's great. But you know what? It's impossible for the conclusion to be false. So we will never get the true-false combination that yields invalidity. And if you're not invalid, then by default, you're valid. So let's look at another tricky one. I love all logic, but I don't love deductive reasoning. Therefore, the moon is made of green cheese. Is this valid or invalid? Take a second and think about it. This argument is also valid. Now, why? Let's look. It's a non sequitur. The, the premise seems to have nothing to do with the conclusion. Now the conclusion, therefore the moon is made of green cheese, can actually be false. So we know when we're trying to apply our test for validity, we do get the potential for falseness to the conclusion, so that's good. But take a look at the premise. The premise is, I love all logic, but I don't love deductive reasoning. Now we know that deductive reasoning is a part of logic. So you can't love all logic and then say, but I don't love this part of logic. That's a contradiction. So the premise here is a contradiction, and a contradiction, if you remember, means that that sentence can never be true. That sentence is always false. So why does that make this argument valid? It makes it valid because invalidity only comes in one case, when we have true premise and false conclusion. But what you can see here is we will never have that case, because even though if we have the possibility of a false conclusion, we can never have the possibility of a true premise because the premise is a contradiction. So we always have false premise to whatever we want. And if it's not invalid, the argument must be valid. Philosophy is easy. Philosophy can be hard. Therefore, logic is easy and not easy. Is this valid or invalid? This argument is valid. And it's valid because it's very similar to the argument we just looked at. 
Uh, if you take a look, you'll spot that the conclusion here, logic is easy and not easy, is a contradiction. So that means the conclusion is always false. But if you look at the premises, the premises contradict each other. So we can never have both premises or all the premises true at the same time. So just like before, even though the conclusion is always false, we can never make it so all the premises are true at the same time. We can only make it so one of the premises is true at a time. So we never get the combination where all our premises are true and the conclusion is false at the same time, which means it's not invalid. And if it's not invalid, it's valid. So this is the last of our tricky arguments. I'm awesome. I also don't like cats. Therefore, I'm awesome. Is this valid or invalid? This argument doesn't rely on any concepts of contradiction or tautology to show that it's valid. In fact, you just need to look at the argument itself and you'll see that it is valid. The reason why is the first premise says, I'm awesome. And it do I don't even care what the second premise is. Uh, it says, I don't like cats, which can be true. Now, whenever the first premise is true, we'll see that the conclusion must be true which means that whenever all the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. It's impossible for me to get true-false, so this argument is valid. Now, some of you will object and say that this is actually a bad argument. You've been taught all along never to argue like this because this is circular reasoning. This is begging the question, and that's true. You're right. But circular reasoning isn't invalid. It turns out to be perfectly valid. The problem with circular reasoning isn't its logical form of validity. It's something else. So what I'm trying to illustrate in a lot of these examples is validity is certainly an important test about whether or not an argument is good, but it's not the only thing we would consider. Now the last concept we need to sort of round out our basic understanding of arguments is soundness. And a sound argument builds on the concept of validity. So an argument is sound if and only if two things are true. The first is that it is valid. So whenever you're testing for soundness, the first thing you want to do is you want to ask, is the argument valid? Now, if the argument is valid, we have a second condition that must be satisfied, which is that all the premises are actually true. So in validity, we just pretend that the premises are true. We don't actually ask if it's true in real life. But when we assess arguments for soundness, we do actually care about truth. Now, this is important because in real life, we actually care about sound arguments, not just valid. Uh, but I'm going to sort of show you why this is problematic for a course in logic. So here's an argument. If I have a coffee, then I'm alert. I'm not alert, therefore I didn't have a coffee. Is this sound, valid but not sound, or invalid? Take a second and think about it. Now you should see that this argument is valid. This argument is valid because of its structure. If circle implies square, not square, then not circle. That's a standard form of reasoning. It's a form that we're going to look at a lot coming up. But the question is, is it sound? So I know that it's valid. Now I have to ask, are the premises true? Well, is it true that I, Alex Koo, if I have a coffee, then I'm alert? And is it true right now that I'm not alert? Well, I don't know. Well, maybe I know, but certainly you don't know. And so the problem with me asking you questions about whether or not things are sound is that it's hard to know whether or not things are actually true in the real world. And I don't want this course to be a, a test of your knowledge of me or obscure facts about the world. So I could never really ask you whether or not this is sound. It's tricky to know in most cases. Now there are some exceptions to this. I could ask you whether or not this argument is sound, valid but not sound, or invalid. The first premise is every sentence is a tautology or a contradiction. This sentence is not a tautology, therefore that sentence is a contradiction. Now the first thing we want to do is ask whether or not this argument is valid. Uh, and it does seem valid. It says circle or square, not circle, therefore square. This is exactly the same as we looked at in the first video of this unit. And we talked about this in terms of fries or salad. If I want fries or salad, I don't want fries. Therefore, I want salad. Looks good. Now, is it sound? Here, I could ask you whether or not this argument is sound. The reason why is because I've given you a definitional style sentences. So if I look at the second premise, this sentence is not a tautology. That seems OK. But what about the first one? Every sentence is a tautology or a contradiction. Uh, well, that's actually false. Now, I haven't actually explained to you why it's false, but intuitively you should realize why. 
a, a tautology is a sentence that's always true. A contradiction is a sentence that's always false. But surely there are some sentences that are in between, which are sometimes true and sometimes false, like it's raining. It's raining is sometimes true and it's sometimes false. So it's not the case that every sentence is a tautology or contradiction. So the answer here is that the argument is valid but not sound. So in general, we're not going to look at soundness. We're going to focus on validity as a property. But you can see how I can ask you questions about soundness by using technical logical definitions and terms that will test your grasp of, of, of validity, but also of definitions we use in the class. Now, finally, we should sort of point out that uh, we're leaning on abstractions a lot here uh, to sort of help us do some of these tricky arguments. And we're going to entirely move to this soon. And it's really helpful to abstract away because it's a nice tool to see why things are actually valid or invalid. Uh, and you can sort of see from this example, I love all logic, but I don't love deductive reasoning. That's circle and not circle, therefore square. And you can see why this is valid because circle and not circle is a contradiction and that's clear as day. So there's no way we can make the premise true and the conclusion false at the same time. So that's all for our first unit in terms of introductions to arguments. Of course, the core concept that you have to walk away with is validity. This course is essentially 12 weeks of studying validity, and you really want to make sure that you know and understand the definition intimately and can really apply that test. You're looking for true premises and false conclusions.